Okay, so maybe let's get started. It's a great pleasure to have Mike Friedman from Santa Barbara Station Q uh, visiting just for today. Uh, which will be a short visit. Um, and uh, you know, before I uh, introduce uh, his talk, I want to remind you there's a talk on Friday as well by Mason. Uh, an email announcement will go out uh, soon. But uh, yeah, this is slightly different timing. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's up on the board, 10.30 on Friday. Uh, but today's talk is uh, will be given by Mike. Uh, so I learned that Mike, at some point early in his career, was trying to decide between doing mountaineering and mathematics. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, at least, you know, for luckily for us, uh, he made the right choice uh, in terms of priorities. I don't think he's given up mountaineering, but slightly more emphasis on the mathematics, and uh, he's been very influential, bringing a lot of. You know, advanced math into condensed matter physics. Um, maybe not the rigor, but at least the mathematical ideas which have been very useful uh, recently. And I think this talk today will be an example of that uh, quantum cellular automata in three dimensions. Thank so. you. Yeah, thank you, Ash, for arranging the talk. Uh, Actually, I'm not even sure you should be here because this is a subject that you've written a paper on. But, uh, <laughs> most of the information is uh, rather elementary. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Matt Hastings. So we, we have a uh, paper posted about six weeks ago on the archive if you want to take a look. Uh, some details will be in there that I'll have to go over too quickly or skip. Uh, Matt has another paper posted maybe a month earlier uh, on the same, broadly speaking, the same uh, set of ideas. So I think you might fairly say that this is the second most interesting talk uh, that could be given on this subject. I think the, uh, the other paper, which has worked with Kutowski and uh, Jean-Wan Ha, uh, it's actually about a very curious example in three dimensions which can be disentangled by cellular automata. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't discuss that informally, but what I want to focus on is the branch of the collaboration with Matt, where we decided to try to understand to what extent cellular automata have the, an aspect of an incompressible flow. Uh, the subject was developed uh, in one dimension uh, initially, and uh, uh, one of the things I'll be explaining is called the GNBW index, which um, uh, Gross, Nesma, uh, uh, Potts, Werner, uh, which I'll just call flow for short, flux. And the question was, in one dimension, you see something sort of flowing along, uh, well, uh, has an incompressibility in the sense that if you measure it at one point of the line, you'll measure the same thing at another point of the line. And we wanted to know whether this held in high dimensions. So that was sort of the motivation for uh, the investigation. But uh, what we found uh, is a uh, an interesting algebraic object. So. Let's let x be a space. What we'll be discussing today is, uh, you might say it's an abelian group, which is a Planck group of space. Well, it's q of x. And it's the quotient of quantum cellular automata on x divided by finite depth quantum circuits on x. I'll explain what both of these are and why you can take the quotient and why the result is a feeling. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of the talk is once I've kind of made this a familiar object, I'll construct a homomorphism of this abelian group. To Hong the first cohomology. It's coefficients from z to z, which is something that a flow, an incompressible flow, would give you. So 
So just to disentangle a little bit, H upper one is uh, dual to H lower dimension minus one for point three duality. So you should think of H upper one as sort of co-dimension one hypersurfaces in a manifold. And a hum from this into Z would measure transport of something through these hypersurfaces. So that's a sense in which we will discover that this contains flow information. So we don't succeed, and it's probably not possible, we don't see, exceed, succeed in finding like a vector field microscopically divergent zero, but we discover it's homological residue. In other words, if you have an incompressible flow, then you can compute a, a number, which is the flux through a hypersurface. And that's the number we can extract without ever finding the flow itself. So that's a look ahead of the entire talk. Yes? You said it's a functor, so you mean that uh, any continuous map between states and kids under a homomorphic continuous loop is that right? Yeah, I was a little bit loose. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I mean, actually, I should say, I mean, to be extremely loose, uh, this is, when I say that this is a space, I'm really thinking very strongly in the sense of coarse geometry. So for me, and in this talk, there's absolutely no difference between the real line and the integers. Okay, they're equivalent to each other. I think physicists will get this immediately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like a, a fine lattice model of the real line. Uh, and there's lots of details in the paper about how to take limits and so on and what we really mean. But let's just kind of surf over all that. Okay. Okay. So maybe I'm getting ahead, but this is sort of the GNVW index embedded in some high dimensional space. Is that well, it'll be the automorphisms will be automorphisms of operator algebras indexed by sites in a high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you say Q of X, does it contain this or it, it's does exhaust? It contain, sorry, does it contain, what's this? So you have this Q of X, which is I think of as all the non-trivial quantum cellular automata on yeah. this space. Right, regarding the finite depth quantum circuits is trivial. Trivial, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, the GNBW index is one example of a non trivial index, is an example of that. Right, and now we have a second example because of the other uh, Hastings collaboration. Right. So, kind of put that to the side in your mind mm -hmm. because I'm not going to be exploring the Germain and Fanon example. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be exploring the sense, the extent to which the GNBW index can be generalized to higher dimensions. Yeah, that's right. And Higher dimensions isn't necessarily three, it could be 20 dimensions. Right. Okay. okay, so I owe a lot of definitions, I think. Uh, so uh, I think I should start by saying what a um, finite depth quantum circuit is. And <clears throat> finite depth quantum circuit is really a picture, it's usually drawn something like this. Much this long, but <laughs> so if you have played, you know, with quantum computing, which uh, networks of any kind, tensor networks, uh, this is sort of a familiar-looking thing. You should think of each of these little strings here as small degrees of freedom Hilbert spaces indexed by points h i. And in, let's just assume for the rest of the talk that each of these local Hilbert spaces is a qubit. There's lots of interesting stuff with the trits, banks, and so on. Can't be bothered. Uh, and then these little rectangles represent gates. So these rectangles are, um, well, they've been four by four unitary matrices in this example. So the idea is that the uh, uh, qubits are sitting there, and then you apply to disjoint blocks of them. It, it, couldn't, it could be more than two at a time. I mean, this is just like a canonical example. Choose the smallest one of those interesting. It's a bit like, in, in philosophy, it's like the Trotter extension.
you know, the Trotter expansion, you're trying to exponentiate uh, a sum of non-commuting terms. And what uh, you do is you kind of make uh, each term small and then alternate. So you could think that you organize, if you're trying to construct an evolution, you could think that you organize uh, into commuting terms that commute because they're disjoint. And then you do another set of terms that wouldn't have commuted with the first. Then you go back and do the first set. But this is uh, this is of interest technologically because this is how people expect to do quantum computation, to build a quantum computer. They expect to produce a complicated unit, unitary by uh, a long composition of very small units. And the, uh, so the words finite depth means that this is bounded. This is the depth. Think of that as some fixed number like 100. And then what's probably infinite, or very near at the infinite, is the, uh, the integer storing parts of Now, the, these pictures uh, are actually not parametrized necessarily by the integers of the real line. They're parametrized by the space apps. So it's hard to draw the picture, but you can imagine that you have a manifold or a you know, more general space, and you sprinkle points rather densely on it. And each of those are qubits. And then uh, you let them interact in small groups, but you change the groupings around as you go. That's this kind of shifting back and forth. But you only do it for a finite amount. And uh, I've taken a lot of time discussing this, but now I have to disappoint you and say this is regarded as completely trivial. So in other words, any, any state that you can make from tensor product state by finite depth quantum circuit state is regarded as of no interest to this audience. Uh, it's topo for instance, it's topologically driven. So that's why it's in the denominator here. So now I have to explain to you the more interesting thing, which is a generalization of this. And this is uh, uh, quantum cellular automata, which is kind of an obscure name. Uh, and here, what it really is, it's, uh, auto it's an automorph, it's an R local. Our local automorphism of the uh, operator algebra associated with all the degrees of freedom. So that's the endomorphism algebra. But the big tensor product of all the local degrees of freedom. And I'm not going to worry about infinities here too much. Uh, so in most cases, we we'll just find of uh, Google number of points or something. <laughs> uh, and R local means that if you have, so let's let's say alpha is such a thing. Alpha is it's such an endomorphism. The word R local means so it's an automorphism of the endomorphism algebra. It says that if you apply it to an operator, in the endomorphisms. Then its support is contained in a neighborhood of R, radius R, R is the radius, of the support of the original operator. And this is where topology comes in. So this whole subject I'm going to talk about is a beautiful confluence of extremely elementary subjects. That's what's great about it. The most elementary aspects of geometric topology was the most elementary aspects of operator algebras, like the letter burden and decomposition and things like that. Each subject on itself would be completely trivial and known for 70 years, but when you mix them together, they're tremendous. Sorry, what was NR? What's R? NR. N sub R. N sub R. Oh, N stands for neighborhood. So in other words, if you have an operator, you, here's your big space X. You know, and X is really this discrete collection of points, right? And now you have an operator O that's supported in this region. Maybe I should be clear. Uh, when I say an operator is supported in the region, what it really means is the operator is some interesting operator on these degrees of freedom, tensor the identity on the complementary degrees of freedom. Oh, oh, I, I will omit saying tensor the identity on the complementary. And now, if I take alpha of O, 
then that's the automorphism of the algebra. So the algebra sort of takes me to some new operator somewhere else. Now, if it was just a general automorphism, that new operator might be supported everywhere. But the, algebra, the geometric condition is that the new operator support wherever it is. Say this is the support of the new operator. It lies in some predetermined uh, radius r. That's the neighborhood of the support of the original operator. Yes? So suppose instead of requiring that the support of the new operator be nearby, you can allow the support of the new operator to be far away, but still like finite radius? Not allowed. Not allowed. Is there anything interesting that would Yes. Yes, that? yes. That's a good, great subject, but it's not the subject of this talk. So for example, one way to get automorphism from the operator algebra is simply to take a transformation of the space. If I take the space and I shift it, you know, each lattice point goes to another lattice point, then that induces, that permutation on degrees of freedom induces an automorphism of the operators. Uh, and that would be R local if I shift the plane. But if I rotate the plane, connection with Dominic's question, that would not meet the definition of being R local because it lies far from the center of rotation of the plane. But you can develop that subject. Yes? Are you going to say anything about unitarities? I have. Sorry? I have. I erased it already. See, I said four by four unitaries. <laughs> 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 In the QCA part. In the numerator of the... Oh, the, oh. Maybe it's trivially unitary? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, these are all star, uh, the, I, I, I haven't said anything about the star structure. These are all star automorphisms. So all these automorphisms are actually realized by conjugation by a unitary operator. So, and in fact, yeah, that, and that, that, that explains the choice of notation. Notice I use capital letters here, and use small letters here, that was intentional. Because the finite depth harm circuit manifested as a unitary, and these are automorphisms. And the connection is that if you have an operator, you can write this. And then the unitary becomes an automorphism. And all the automorphisms of C star algebra lies in that point. OK, so I think the next uh, order of business is to explain why finite depth quantum circuits are even a normal subgroup of QCA. That's already interesting. This is like the math notation for normal subgroup. Okay. So what I have to convince you is that if I have a, such a circuit, I conjugate it by local automorphism, it becomes another circuit. And the first lemma in doing this is just to see if it's right for a single gate. A single gate is a special case of finite depth quantum circuit. Suppose I have a single gate, nothing else is happening, and I conjugate it. Well, it will become some operator, but the R condition says that it, the operator will only act on some bounded number of these strings. It will be a general operator, but a general operator can be written exactly even as a finite depth quantum circuit, but the depth might be long. So it might be wide and it might be long, but you can, if this is a gate G, then alpha of G has some diagrammatic representation like this. So this looks hopeful. Let me point out that it would be trivial to show this as a normal subgroup if Instead of it being wide, it had just come out. So, so the question is how to promote this observation that uh, conjugation or acting by alpha on a gate gives you sort of a fat gate. How to promote that into an understanding of alpha acting on a, not just a single gate, but the entire quantum circuit, okay? Now, there's a trick to make this work, 
I, so in other words, what I have to do is I have to show you a picture. I have to construct in your mind a mental picture. If this is a quantum circuit C, I have to construct in your mind a mental picture of the quantum circuit alpha C. Okay? And rough answer is I'm going to tell you to replace each gate with a fat gate. Okay? But the problem is the fat gates overlap in an inconvenient way, and you might worry about that. How can that work? Because they're much wider. And the trick is coloring, color coding. So suppose we divided our qubits into uh, colors. Like, uh, suppose these were colored uh, A. These two were A, B, C, C, D. So suppose periodic three colors like that. If the expansion was just the nearest, well, if the expansion was at this scale, I guess the three coloring would be sufficient because what we would do is we wouldn't attempt to implement all the uh, gates at the first level of the original circuit at once. We'd only attempt to implement the A gates, one third of them. And then we'd have room to let them be fat. And then we'd implement the D gates. Then we can implement the C-gates. So actually, when we go in the paper technically about what we mean by a space and what's it good to X and so on, there's some issues about we need spaces that are conveniently n-colorable in this way. So Euclidean and hyperbolic spaces work fine, but you can construct, construct some bizarre examples where you'd have trouble doing this. So we exert those in the paper. Another area for future study. Yes. Iris. Sorry, so is it like if you start originally like you have two like non-overlapping small gates, then they should commute because they're on different yeah. like, sets of qubits. But then once you apply this, um, like you know, once you make them fat, then like their supports overlap. So is it still clear that they're going to commute? If yeah, they will. They will way? still commute even though the supports overlap because the image of an automorphism of things that commute. So the automorphic property preserves the algebraic structure. And if the commutator was zero and you do alpha, the commutator is still zero. I think the, the point actually goes in the other direction, which is that um, uh, after the automorphism, we're forced to put things that still commute on different levels, just because there's no room for them on one level. Uh, Okay, now, um, now we're warmed up for the, uh, the first, I think, exciting result. All this has sort of been definitional. The first thing that's exciting is that the group is abelian. And this was a big surprise to me. We discovered this. And the proof that it is abelian is simply um, to draw this picture. Let alpha 1 be. Uh, one automorphism, and alpha 2 be another. And consider, I'll have to explain this picture. <coughs> yes, and to explain this picture, I realized I forgot to say something. Uh, in the entire setup, in the entire setup of all these definitions, uh, we work what we'll call stably. What that means is ancilla qubits are always allowed. So in other words, at first, I spoke of just like I put down a bunch of points on the manifold, and those are degrees of freedom. But it actually makes the subject much softer and more valuable and much more conducive to topology if we're allowed to, for example, double the number of degrees of freedom by putting down a nearby point near to our previous ones, and then just have the original operators be the identity of those points. This is very common in the subject. So it, and so those are useful, and I'm going to do that. And what, what this diagram means is I've suppressed an entire space direction as a point. This point, you're actually supposed to think of the entire control space X. So if you want to visualize X, you can think of it as disappearing into the back of the blackboard and coming out in front. It might be like the real line, or it might be a 10 dimensional manifold. And this other point here 
is just another copy of X, okay, existing kind of in a parallel world. And what what this symbol here is this is the swap gate. This is just simply these are the original I mean, these are the original X's and these are the ancillas and this is swap and this is swap back. And swap squared is the identity which is seen in this sort of string diagram. If you swap and swap back, nothing's happened. But swap is merely a special case of a finite depth quantum circuit. It's actually depth one matrices that swap. So these swaps are in the denominator of the group that we're constructing. So we're, they're negligible. We are allowed to divide out by them. Equivalently, we're allowed to insert them in our picture wherever we want. And by inserting them judiciously, it becomes obvious that this is a commutative structure because we can put them on different strings. You know, once we put it over here, it looks like this, right? And then there's no difference when we did the alphas. So it, it basically what we're showing is that um, compositional multiplication is actually equivalent to another multiplication that was in our pocket all the time, which was um, uh, disjoint union, action, acting on disjoint and cylinder systems. So that, that's what proves it's a deal. Okay, now to uh, make progress, I need to tell you uh, a key algebraic notion, which is that of support algebra. So this idea goes back to Bravi and Bialy, and Matt Hastings used it in early work. It's very important in understanding, uh, for example, Bravi and Bialy proved that um, in 1D commuting projector, gap commuting projector Hamiltonians uh, have uh, tensor product ground states. So those Hamiltonians can't produce topological phases in one dimension. And then Matt Hastings extended that later by the same methods uh, using matrix product decompositions to show that uh, there weren't bosonic topological phases in 1D. So the idea of support algebra has been very prominent in condensed matter, and it's quite simple algebraically. It's that if you have an algebra sitting in the tensor product of two other algebras, then the support algebra of A in V1 uh, is the smallest S such that A is contained in S tensor V2. There clearly is such a smallest because you can just take intersection. Now, there's a sad point arising now, which is I'm going to tell you the idea of this index, this flow, but I won't prove for you that it's well defined. Some of you know. Esther knows the proof. It's beautiful. It uses the Wedderburn theory of uh, classification of simple algebras in finite dimensions that they're all matrix algebras. It uses it in a beautiful way. But there just isn't time to get where I'm going. If I give you that proof, it's on pages 7 through 10 of the preprint that Matt and I have on the archive, and it's also in the appendix in a fermionic version of Ashman's proof. But the rough idea of the index is. You, let's just, it's a one-dimensional idea, so let's just think of sites on the real line. And with each site, we have a small operator algebra. Now my, I have to think of these points as um, bigger than C2, bigger than qubits, because for the picture I want to draw, I want the interaction radius to be 1, not R is going to be 1. The way I can do that is I can group sites into clumps. So if the interaction radius was previously 10, if I could clump the sites together into bigger finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, then what previously was radius 10 is now within radius 1. 
So you should think that think about operator algebra as a big bag of jelly at each point, and when you do alpha to it in QCA, the jelly kind of flops around and gets into a, expands to a bigger operator algebra like this. And if I look at this point here, its operator algebra, its jelly flops in like that, out like that. And the index is gotten by taking a cut between these two points and asking, well, how much of this jelly flopped to the left and how much of this jelly flopped to the right and take the difference. So what it is, and you, what you do is, so it's the, the index, the flux, I'll call it, index, is equal the support algebra up to the right. So take the support algebra to the right. That's the stuff that goes this way. And I'll minus, in a sense, the support algebra to the left. That's the stuff that went that way. So taking the difference of transports to get the net flux to the right. And of course, I can't subtract algebra. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the log of the dimensions. And then for conventional reasons, I'm going to put in a half. Take one half log dimension here, too. So talking about how much stuff is moving back and forth, that can be conceptualized as dimension, these finite dimensional algebras, these word algebras. Uh, I take the log of the dimension just because I want something that's additive instead of multiplicative to make it look more like you know, transporting oranges by truck or something. Uh, and then one half, can you guess why the one half? The one half is in there because uh, people like to think about the underlying Hilbert space instead of the operator algebra. So on the log scale, taking the square root of the dimension, you should cut the log in half. So that mean that makes that makes it clear from this definition that if the automorphism alpha is simply the one induced by shifting sites over by one, then the answer to this flux is one. That's how the definition is cooked up. If it's qubits. Right? If it was qubits, yeah. OK, so my apologies that I can't prove that this is well defined, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fact. And, uh, uh, and the goal now of the rest of the talk is to construct this homomorphism, to explain it to you in a very visual way. And there are two, uh, there are two pieces to uh, understanding this homomorphism. Is this a question? Yeah. Yes? So, so S right is the support algebra of... Oh, oh sorry. Or is, Yeah, so we have this site. We have this site, and its algebra sort of flopped over these three sites. And then I group these two together, and this as a, by itself. And I consider of this algebra here, I consider the support that's contained on this one. Does that make sense? Because there's a tensor decomposition here. It's these two tensor this one. I have this algebra that spans the two. I can talk about the minimum piece here I need to contain the image under alpha. That gives the first S that I took log dimension of. And then do the similar thing for the image of this. Here's its left support. It's the difference of those log dimensions. Okay, so um, basically there are two ideas in constructing this flow of uh, homomorphism. Uh, and one is dimensional reduction, which everyone is very familiar with in condensed matter. You just pretend the high dimension system is a low dimensional one by being dumb, ignoring a lot of things. And then the second is the verification of linearity, which is the trickier part. I mean, this is a group homomorphism. It turns out that um, uh, 
uh, everything can be checked. It turns out it suffices to check this linearity property in an extremely simple case. <coughs> this field like is sufficient to check on the two torus. So in other words, the question becomes on the two torus. I can consider the meridian. And let's just fix with these conventions for what meridian means. This is M. And I draw the longitude on this torus. That's M. <coughs> and I can also draw the diagonal of the torus, which is the meridian plus the longitude, which um, I guess I could draw like this. Sorry. Not like that. There we go. Call that delta. And a special case of linearity is that the flux, the GNBW index, across delta should be equal to flux across M plus the flux across L. That's the additivity that you would expect, for example, for an incompressible flow. But it only depends on the homology class of the thing you're cross section you're studying and it's additive with respect to union of classes. So this would be um, completely obvious if we really had a divergence free vector field and we were integrating flux across these hypersurfaces. But that's the mental picture we're trying to validate, so we can't just say that's the proof. Uh, but now you might say, well, wait a second. Uh, this. This flux is just a so far a one-dimensional concept. How did I even talk about flux across a hypersurface? That's where the dimensional reduction part comes in. Because I can take this torus, and in three different contexts, I can stupidly think of it as a circle by compressing a direction. So for instance, if I want to focus on flux across the meridian, I imagine the torus as just sort of the longitudinal circle and take this direction and pay no attention to it. Which is fine, because all the sites along meridians, there are a finite number of them, and I can just tensor them all up and have still finite and large dimensional local Hilbert spaces on the circle when I've dimensionally reduced. And then the flux across M, then by definition, just becomes a flux through this point. And if you're worried about applying flux on finite size systems, there's some little dance between the R, the radius, and the injectivity radius of the, the manifolds in question. So it works out that way. And similarly, I can do the flux through uh, the longitude in a dual fashion by, uh, by compressing longitudinal directions to points. Just take that quotient. And that gives some other circle. And then the flux through the longitude is now the flux through one point in that circle. And similarly, I can foliate the torus by parallel copies of the diagonal and crush each of those to a point and have a well-defined F sub delta. <coughs> so then it makes it, it's a, it's a good question, do these add up? The answer is they do. Very now nice. the uh, proof uh, has some interesting elements. Uh, it, it actually has two ingredients. <coughs> Two ideas to the proof. One is geometric, and it's to show that this whole concept of alphas, of uh, quantum cellular automata, uh, plays well with <coughs> covering spaces. Uh, and immersions. And the second is this an algebraic notion called visibly simple. And one of the goals for my talk is at the very end, you'll see what visibly simple means. And I think this is actually the most um, long lasting aspect of this paper with math, uh, and it's entirely due to math. Uh, 
I think 100 years from now, uh, students, when they take their algebra course, will learn about simple algebras, and then they'll learn about physically simple algebras. <laughs> okay, so what do I mean by plays well with immersions? Uh, I, want to I want to show you that um, if I have a cylinder, <coughs> And I'm interested in the flux through a certain meridian. I'm interested in flux here, call it F. I want to ask the question, what happens if I unwrap the cylinder by covering space? Well, the first thing is I want to argue that the alpha here lifts to an alpha there. But there is some um, quantum cellular automata here covering this one. And second, I want to show that its flux of twiddle is just multiplicative. That f twiddle is the degree of the cover times f. Just the cover of three times around, multiplied by three. Again, this would be totally obvious if we really had an incompressible vector field here. But we don't. So the first point is why should alpha lift? Well, uh, it has, it's the locality. You see, the operator algebra is generated by operators of small support by addition and multiplication. And alpha is defined on these operators to take off the operators to have not much bigger support. So, since you're myopic and you only uh, need to define alpha on these small supported operators, you have no idea what space you're working in. So you might as well just start defining it up here. So, Alpha pulls back under covering, and it also pulls back under a more general notion called immersion, which the topologists and geometers in the audience know well, but mathematical physicists might not recognize the term, but you'll see it immediately uh, in an application all day. Directed toward proving this multiplicity. So suppose we do start out with this um, alpha downstairs. It turns, out, it turns out I'm disappointed by the fact that there's no genus on this surface. You'll see why that disappoints me. But I'm going to fix that for you by what's called the Kirby torus trick. So the Kirby introduced this to understand topological manifolds in the late 60s, and it's had some impact in condensed matter physics. So the torus trick is this. Um, you add two linked bands to the picture. Now, this is kind of a quiz for the audience. Uh, I'm just trying to see how much uh, geometric topology has penetrated into condensed matter. So raise your hand if you recognize this picture as a drawing of a torus with a puncture. Is this recognized? Most people do not recognize this? Oh, well maybe this point needs elaboration. Because uh, what I'm about to say won't make sense. Is this, are you being shy or is this really mm -hmm. an obscure point? Obscure point. Oh, okay. Good, good, good. All right, so technically this is a picture. So now there's a question here. Did these bands cross or are they held apart at different heights? First, let's hold them apart part at different heights. Then I claim that these two spaces are actually homeomorphic or diffeomorphic. And the way, the easiest way to uh, get some evidence for this, you know, physicists like evidence, is notice on the torus there are two curves that meet in the point. One point, transverse curves meet, the, meet transverse in the point. That doesn't happen in, in uh, disk. But now after I've added these bands, one can easily see the curves color than meeting the point. Ah. Okay, that should and now if you actually think about the surface, you probably can picture that you can squeeze it down to no more than the union of the two colored curves. Can you see that? Squeeze it. And similarly can you see in this picture that you can squeeze this down the 
union of these two colored groups. <coughs> and that, that would constitute the group with the same surface. Uh, should I go on? You just trace out the boundary. And you see this oh, boundary. yeah, you can trace out the boundary. Yeah, so on this one, it's easy to trace out the boundary. On this one, it takes more patience. Let's start here. I'll make the picture a little messy, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. You got more takers? <laughs> okay. But now the word immersion means that these two bands are actually put down together. It's kind of like a covering space, but it, it locally it looks a bit like a covering space at that point. Because the point in this rectangle are two pre images. And similarly, you can pull back and out the twiddle here. If you see uh, an alpha residing in the plane, it's the same local argument. Similarly, if I draw these bands crossed in the cylinder, I can induce an alpha to a new alpha called out prime, not twiddle yet. I can induce a new alpha on this surface. Okay, now for your topology exam, do you recognize that this surface, the torus with two punctures, is the same as this surface, the cylinder with these two bands attached? It's a very slight generalization of what we did over here. So here I attach two bands to a disc, and I got a one puncture torus. Suppose instead of attaching them to a disc, I attach them to a cylinder by removing a puncture then I'd have a two-puncture torus. Okay, so this is this. And now, what the heck was I doing putting this genus in? Why did I want alpha prime? Because I can produce a very interesting covering space of this, and there are only boring covering spaces of the cylinder. The cylinder has an abelian fundamental group. This is a free fundamental group. This surface has what's called an irregular threefold cover. Uh, Covering spaces are very much like the theory of subgroups, and the usual ones you run into are associated with normal subgroups, but irregular covers are precisely the ones associated with non-normal subgroups. And there's an index three non-normal subgroup of the free group here, which corresponds to the covering which I'll draw for you. So I'm claiming, I won't give the proof, but I'm claiming that there, and I'm claiming that any topology undergraduate as an exercise should be able to construct this covering space. And because the subgroup is not normal, it's possible that this circle unwraps three times here, and this circle just lifts to three short circles. The reason is, the circle does not unwrap if it lives in the fundamental group of the covering space. And these two circles, while conjugate in the fundamental group, are not equal in the fundamental group. If I take a base point here, that loop and this loop are conjugate, but they're not equal. So it, it's possible one of them lies in a certain normal subgroup and the other does not. And that's what's going on here. This end, it lies in the subgroup. It does not unwrap. Here it does not lie in the subgroup, and it does unwrap. OK, so what? What good is this? We can use dimensional reduction to reduce this picture. This is another application of dimensional reduction. We can reduce this picture to this picture. In other words, you can just take a, a spine in this manifold like that and ignore all detail. Just crush everything brutally to that spine. And now we have a 1D situation to which the JNBW index theory does apply. The fact it's not literally a line but has a branch is fine as long as the radius r, which means we consider is small relative to any, any cycles. There can even be closed cycles, as long as they're a large curve. OK, but now we're done. We've proved multiplicativity, at least in the case of three-fold covers, because 
whatever the flux was, whatever the flux was uh, leaving this circle, we see microscopically the identical situation on all these three ends. So we see three times the original flux. Here we see the flux twiddle entering the unwrapped flux. And because of conservation of index over one-dimensional structures, we get that the input is equal to the output. So this shows it's a multiplicative under threefold covers and two perturbations on this construction shows multiplicative under any integer. Okay, so uh, we're pretty close to a uh, punchline. Uh, so now I have to explain how we use this to construct linearity. How to, how to, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't erase this. This is what I'm going to prove. Sorry, how hard is it to prove multiplicativity under covering spaces directly? Like maybe using your dimensional reduction trick again, so you like collapse to one dimension, consider flux across a point in the middle of your interval, and it seems like roughly your Hilbert spaces have just tripled. You're just taking triple tensor products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I, I don't think um, I'd be surprised if there's a local argument. Uh, I mean, the point is these bags of jelly, you know, these operator algebras really aren't segregated into small chunks. Uh, so, uh, kind of localizing the Oh, okay, so here's some evidence that it's not easy to localize these things, is the technology of this index was used to prove in 1D a bunch of things that are false in 2D. Like there are topological, you know, uh, commuting projector phases in 2D. So one really has to be cautious. And in fact, in our paper, we proved this unwrapping trick in dimensions 2, 3, and 4 by three separate arguments. And we don't know it in higher dimensions. But we don't need it for this, uh, for the attitude. Uh, actually, since this is here, let me, maybe I'll start with this side. Okay, so in order, so the idea for the punchline to prove linearity, remember that the entire goal for the rest of the talk is just this equation, is we take a, a D by D cover of the torus. So think of that as now a really big square. The original torus maybe was this square. And we lift the longitude to this long, you know, maybe L twiddle. And the meridian lifts to this long line here. And then the diagonal class is represented by some resolution of the picture. Longitude here. The diagonal class is represented by a resolution here, okay? But the point is that the size scale in which we do this resolution is independent of D. It's independent of how big a cover. So if we can show that there, that this formula is true, if we take these D squared covers, uh, each of these curves gets unwrapped D times. So we have a variable D we can put in this equation. So let me put a minus sign D here, minus sign D here. What we want to show is that this in absolute value is less than some constant independent of D. If this is independent of D, then we actually get equality. And it looks like there's some hope that it's independent of D because the resolution is taking place in some constant size region that doesn't depend on D. But the juice that makes the argument go through is this concept of visibly simple. So I won't even define it until I come to the moment that I use it. You'll solve for the definition yourself when you see the argument. So, what I'm going to do is look at first the algebra uh, near delta. So this is the site algebra generated by all sites within some small band of 
of the diagonal curve. Then I'm going to define its support algebra, maybe to the right. And I'll draw that in the picture. So I take its image under the automorphism alpha, and I look how much that bag of jelly is slopped to the right of the curve. So I have some sort of support algebra here, which is a subalgebra of the algebra generated by these sites. Now, the algebra generated by the sites uh, is simple, potential product of matrix algebras. Alpha of it is simple. And the support algebra is therefore also simple, because if the support algebra factor is a direct sum, the simple algebra mapping in can only go into one of those pieces. Since support algebra, by definition, is the smallest necessary to contain it, it's also simple. So this algebra is simple. That was easy, but it's actually also this much stronger condition, visibly simple. And that's, that's a meaty uh, theorem in the paper, uh, which unfortunately, well, I can't say too much about the proof here, but I'll show you how it's, uh, what it is and how it can be used right now. So the idea is, in order to get this estimate, less than constant, we need some explosive, we need like some gunpowder to blow these algebras into pieces where we can have kind of a near piece and a far piece and have the whole thing, made, ideally the near and the far piece are commutants of each other and then we can understand the dimensions of the algebra they generate in terms of near and far and then near because it's bounded number of sites and has a bounded size and dimension and when we look at the far part well, that'll be sort of the same for this term and these two terms. <coughs> so, the, you know, you can sweep up the details, but the work is going to be to blow these algebras apart using this, this idea. And I think that's sort of what you were thinking, you know, when you said, let's prove directly it's uh, multiplicative undercover. I think you were thinking of kind of trying to break it up into pieces. So, it, 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 it is the right way to think. Okay, so... Let's assume that, let's take um, the part of the support algebra, let's, let's break the support algebra into two pieces. Let's break it into the near piece, which I'll call uh, C1. And then a far piece, C2. So in pictures, C1 is um, this much in yellow and orange, and C2 will be something that you know may encroach a bit in C1. But what I want from these is that I want um, I want each to be simple. And, uh, and each other's commutants. So let's do the easy case. This, I can just take the, I can just define C1 to be the portion of the support algebra which is in the near area. And now it's a subalgebra of something simple. So it's not clear that it's simple. But let's take the easy case that C1 turns out to be simple. So let's just assume simple. And now take C2 just to be its commutant, just to find it to be C1 product. My picture is too small. Let me draw the area of interest larger. Sort of this region here, 
and C2 is uh, some overlapping region. And for this to do us any good, in order to be able to compare the C2 region on both sides of the formula, we need to know that they don't like meet, that they don't come together. So we need to somehow contradict the possibility that the commutant reaches too deep into the near region. So I'm just drawing a picture now where it's reaching rather deep in. So that means that there's an operator that commutes with C1 whose support is here. This is O belonging to the commutant. And suppose its minimal support goes deep into C1. Then take some site here, deep in C1, which is in the support of this O. Then what does it mean for this whole support algebra to be a simple algebra? It means that a non-trivial element, you can find something that doesn't compute with it. Visibly simple means if you have a non-trivial element, you take any site in its support, and you can find something that doesn't commute with that operator near that site that you pick. We call it visibly simple because if you're that operator, you can see the witness that proves uh, uh, non-commutation right nearby. You don't have to go looking for it. It's visibly simple. So that would mean we could find another operator, O prime, located near this point not commuting with O. But that's a contradiction because this algebra was defined to be the commutant of the original algebra, the orange algebra C1, and by O prime having small radius being near this point deep in the support of C1, it would have to lie in C1. And lying in C1 and not commuting with something lying in its commutant is, is a contradiction. So that's, you know, that's just a very rough uh, kind of feel for the algebra that goes into the, uh, the decomposition lemma that's needed uh, to complete the linearity estimate. So uh, you know, surprisingly, uh, I didn't run over too much. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, your questions. So my question is, is your flux morphism surjective? Uh, um, well, yes, it is, because yes. you can you can produce um, every possible image in this by permutation of sides. Okay, good. Yeah, so... so uh, I, I think this would also follow from what Dominic asked you earlier about functoriality and just proving it for S1, but uh, maybe that's equivalent to what you said. Um, so this Q of X is supposed to be like all the topological order that uh, space X supports in some sense? No. Okay. No, that's the other paper that, uh, oh, okay. I, you know, I disappointed Ashwin greatly by talking about the wrong paper. You know, that was my joke at the beginning. This was the second most interesting lecture on the, on the collaboration with Matt. I think what the other side of the collaboration, what they did, I mean, they had this beautiful hundred and something page paper uh, where they took the um, so-called Wong Walker, three-dimensional uh, model based on a fusion category, which is the, uh, it's called the three fermion model. It's uh, uh, sort of a twisted version of the Torah code in which uh, M, uh, E, and EM are all fermions. So you take that three fermion model, uh, you construct it in three dimensions instead of two, and because it was already um, a unimodular tensor category in two dimensions, there's uh, no degeneracy in the ground state, but it still has an interesting entangled ground state. And it is almost certainly true that you, that this ground state is not reducible by finite depth quantum circuit. They spend a lot of time in this paper discussing this point, and there's tremendous physical evidence for this. But they find an explicit quantum cellular automata that uh, takes it to uh, poly operator takes the stabilizers of this uh, exotic state to just poly operators at the sites. And it's a radius 10 isomorphism. So this is Zheng Wan Ha at his best, you know, with his laptop and figuring out, you know, it's just like when he invented the, the uh, his code, the Ha code. 
you know, so it's the same, you know, the same brilliance. Anyway, he found this automorphism untangled thing, and that's what they wrote their paper about. Uh, so th what that means is that we know at least, and now I think we have maybe another. So we have one, maybe two examples of torsion, which wouldn't be reflected in this homomorphism, or mm -hmm. it wouldn't be reflected in that homomorphism that's also in Q. So Q is bigger than permutations of sites, and we don't know how much bigger. Is, is, do you think anything else is distortion, or? I don't know. I, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we have also a tiny additional information. Um, you know, the invariant I described is manifestly non-torsion, but in the paper, in my paper with Matt, we do analyze RP2 and RP3, and we show that there's a Z2 invariant in both of those cases, uh, which doesn't follow from this, so it is a little bit of a new wrinkle. Mm -hmm. But that Z2 uh, invariant requires special pleading we don't know how to do it like an RP4. Uh, yep. So you mentioned that you were considering this close range geometry, but I didn't see in what sense you're actually using the what that geometry? Close range geometry. Oh. It's like over pictures you drew are actually in the continuum. So in what sense are you actually using this close range geometry? Well, I mean, uh, actually, I think a better question would be in what sense am I using the continuum? because the object under discussion is only defined on the finite set of points or taking some appropriate limits accountable set of points. But, you know, I'm really, really what's being discussed is um, automorphisms of an endomorphism algebra generated by a finite number of qubits or finite dimensional root spaces with some uh, distance relations between those points. But I think in some sense you're using the continuum in the fact that you don't want your operators, so suppose you're on a torus or something, you don't want your operators to wrap around the torus. So you need to know that your lattice is not just sexually embedded into like a torus or something like that. Uh, yes. Uh, right, so the injectivity radius plays against this R, and R should be much smaller than the injectivity radius, is what you're saying. Uh, but what I, I mean, the philosophy I have is that we're studying a combinatorial object, and intuition and methods from the continuum. Uh, simplify our language, and that what we're really doing is um, all at the base, you know, machine code, you know, it's all combinatorial on finite dimensional objects. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, for ease in writing the program, we, we work at a higher level language, which is the continuum. So what, yeah. what, you you mentioned there might be another example of torsion. Oh, I, this is just what I hear from uh, uh, Matt that, that those three guys, uh, Hockeysteins and Bukowski, uh, have a second example, which I think they think is order four. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know. But what, what is that? Is that S3 again? Or what, what's the map? Oh, what, what manifold is their second example on? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, it's in three dimensions, and I don't think it, I think it's, it's a sufficiently local construction that it doesn't matter what okay. that is. So this condition on C1 assuming it to be simple, is it just a simplification here, or? It's a, it, yeah, in the paper, here we do the general case. But so it doesn't have to be simple in general if you define the support algebra restricted to the near region. No. It's just a shortcut. Kind of a naive question. Um, so this GMBW, if you define it in 1D, it has to be like a closed loop. Um, otherwise, stuff falls off at the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in general, you know, this generalization to higher dimensions, um, is there some general condition on the manifold X that you can have? Oh, yeah, so you're worried about falling off the edge? Yeah. Yeah, so the way I think about this, um, I didn't use the word in this talk, but in, in topology, so this is another great example of how we import you know, a concept from the continuum. Uh, in topology, there's a, a nice word, germ. I don't know if that's, it, it means like the germ of a function you're at a point. It's not the value of the function at a point, but it's like a, 
in, in verse 11, or of, uh, it, it's thinking about the, uh, it's like the definition of sheep. You know, uh, so, so two functions are equivalent in the germ sense, to your point, if, if they have some neighborhood in which they agree. So like analytic functions are determined by a germ or a point, things like that. So when I talk about, um, when you talk about the index on a line, um, a priori, if the line had an edge, then you really would have this problem of things falling off the edge. But what you can do is you can work in the middle, and you can think not of an automorphism of the algebra, but an endomorphism of the algebra, which takes the stuff generated here and maybe shifts it to some other region. And if you work well away from the cutoffs, you never see that you're not on the line. So you don't, you don't, it's probably more trouble than it's worth to take the appropriate limits to discuss the infinite dimensional algebras and actually work on the real, on the integers honestly. It's easier to just take, you know, finite pieces and look at sub pieces and then these injective endomorphisms and analyze everything at the chart level. I mean, that's, that's implicitly going on when I'm doing these even when I'm pulling back immersions, because things are falling off the edge. And you know, Rob Kirby had the same problem when he used the Torah strip and topological manifolds in 1969. Things fell off the edge, and he realized that he had to think about two Torah. He had to think about a skinnier one inside this, and then the homeomorphism that was pulled back wasn't an automorphism of that skinny one, but it slopped it over into the bigger one. So this issue of the edge, you know, is um, a 50-year-old issue. Solve that and we use the same solution. Questions? Uh, I'll just thank Mike again.